Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. Very excited as we continue our celebration of biodiversity, we have Joe Cutler joining us. Joe is a National Geographic Explorer, an ichthyologist, which is someone who studies fish, if anyone out there didn't know that, and he's a conservationist. He's very interested in the biodiversity of freshwater species uh, in lakes. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer in the past in Cameroon and currently works with the Nature Conservancy in Gabon. He has conducted several fish sampling expeditions, collecting hundreds of fish species, including several that are new to science or so weren't discovered before. Joe's stories, writing, and photographs have appeared uh, in National Geographic Explorers magazine, on National Geographic Learning, as well as National Geographic Adventures website. So Joe, it's so great to have you joining us today. Thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to all the teachers and students for joining us and anybody watching on YouTube. Good morning. Thanks for, for joining in. All right. Well, Joe, before I let you take over, I am going to switch to share screen. We're going to show off National Geographic's uh, Mapmaker Interactive, and we're going to get a feel for where you are and where our classrooms are joining us today. So if you'll just bear with me, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And let's open up that map maker. All right, so you should be able to see my screen now. You can see that red X, that's me. I'm just outside of a town called Guelph, Ontario, here in Canada. And as I pull out a little wider, you can see the little schools marking our classrooms. So we've got a really Canada-rich group today from Ontario. We've got a classroom up here in Thunder Bay. And then most of our classrooms are down here in Southern Ontario. So Peterborough, uh, Burlington, another classroom in Guelph, Mississauga. And if I go out a little bit more, we can see where Joe's joining us in the United States. So here's Joe. I've got the little fish symbol and apparently an extra school out in the middle of the ocean. So I don't know what that's doing there. But there's Joe joining us from San Francisco. And if I go out a little bit further, I'm going to take us across the Atlantic. And you can see here in Africa, this is Cameroon. This is one of the expedition sites uh, where Joe visits. And then I didn't mark it, but here's Gabon down here as well. So, Joe, I'm going to switch back to the Hangout, and you've got the good stuff, so I'm going to let you take over for a bit. Great. Thank you, Joe. Well, I'm going to share with you all today a little bit of the work that I do, and also about who I am and how I got to do the work that I do, because I think it's pretty exciting. I think it's pretty cool stuff, and I hope that someday, maybe one of you all, will be joining me out in the field to discover new species of fish. So I hope to inspire you all a bit and show some beautiful photographs and tell you all a couple fun stories. So let me switch over to share my screen with you all. And can you see my screen now, Joe? We've got it. Perfect. And can you see my presentation? Yeah, it went nice and full screen for us. Perfect. So as I said, my name is Joe Cutler, and I am a fish explorer. And I really think that this is the coolest job I could ever have. I get to travel around the world and discover new species of fish. And I think fish are just about the most incredible thing incredible uh, group of, of animals in the world. The, di the diversity of fishes is just remarkable. You can see here how colorful they are, how many different shapes there are, but I can tell you more about these fishes. There are fish on this slide that eat fruit. There are fish on this slide that eat insects. There are fish on this slide that live only in one area. And then there are other fish that migrate hundreds of miles. There are fish that produce electric signals to communicate with one another. And there are fish that use their fins to grab onto rocks to live in, in rapids and waterfalls. Fish live in practically every aquatic habitat. And they're the most biodiverse group of vertebrates globally. And so many fish have never been discovered. And it's just an open field to go out and find new species if you're willing to go and look for them. And I'm going to be focusing my talk today about some of the work I did in Cameroon looking at the fish biodiversity there. 
But before I start talking about Central Africa, let me give some context as to how I, as a young American, ended up studying fish in Central Africa. I've kind of always been a fish kid. Uh, the photograph here on the left shows my brothers and I. Uh, I'm the short one with the life jacket um, fishing at Clear Lake in California. And I've been a fisherman my whole life and my brothers were fishermen and my parents were fishermen and my grandparents. But it was really just kind of a passion. I love fishing, I love the fish, uh, but I didn't ever think I could work as an ichthyologist or study fish for a living until I went to UC Davis and I met Dr. Peter Wainwright, my first big fish mentor. And he taught my introductory biology course, and I ended up working with him afterwards in his ichthyology lab, studying fish morphology, the shape of fishes and how they evolve. And Peter Wainwright really told me, Joe, take your passion and make it your life. You're a fish kid right now. Become a fish guy. And so that's exactly what I did. I followed my passion and I now study fish for a living. I'm getting a PhD studying fish and fish diversity. And it is the coolest job I, can, I could possibly hope for. Another thing that happened while I was at UC Davis that was really important for my life was I had my first experience in Africa. And I had this through a study abroad program at the University of Ghana. And this gave me about six months to live in Africa, to meet local people, to learn languages, to travel, and to kind of fall in love with Africa and, and start thinking that I might want to pursue a career blending fish and my love of Africa. And so when I finished my studies at UC Davis, I signed up and joined the Peace Corps and uh, served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Cameroon. And this was my first opportunity to travel to Central Africa, and I absolutely loved it. I spent three years in Cameroon and traveled throughout the entire country, uh, including to Berman Village. And this is a satellite photograph taken from Google Maps of Berman. And what you see most clearly is a lake in the center and a little bit of clearing of the forest around it. That is Berman Village. There's about 100 people who live in the entire town, and it sits right next to an incredible lake and two national parks. And when I first arrived in this village, I met the chief and his family. The chief is wearing the Michael Jordan jersey, and his name is Franklin. And th these are some of the most warm, hospitable, and friendly people I've ever met. When I arrived there, they said, Mr. Joe, here's your bedroom. Here's a hot plate of food. You're welcome to come here and stay with us as long as you want. Um, this is your home. Be be comfortable. And I said, wow, Franklin, that's so, so, so nice of you. Um, what can I do to kind of thank you? And he said, well, what, what can you do, Mr. Joe? Um, you, we don't have very many visitors. And I said, well, I have a college degree in biology. And he said, perfect. We've got a high school. Uh, the government secondary school in Berman that's never had a biology teacher, would you be willing to teach there? And I said, sure. And so I started teaching uh, in Berman Village. And this was an incredibly rewarding experience for me because no one in the village had ever taken a single class of biology. So everything was absolutely new to them and people were really excited about it. But it was a little bit more difficult than I had imagined when I first signed up because Berman is extremely remote. I had to hike 20 miles twice a week to get to Berman. And this was rough walking through the rain, through the mud. You had to cross these handmade bridges, as you see in this photograph, uh, bridges made out of vines and tree bark woven by the local people just to get to Bourbon Village. Um, but the community loved it and they were so appreciative of the, the effort and hard work I put into it that they really just opened their, their doors to me. The second thing that the chief told me was, Mr. Joe, we've got this lake here. You like fish, don't you? Go and check out our lake. 
And this is a photograph looking at Lake Berman. And I fell in love with this lake. It was an incredible place to go and fish. And the people of Berman are fishermen. These are several of my students showing off the fish that they caught from the lake. And I started thinking, man, I need to start collecting these fish and studying what type of species live in this lake in central Cameroon. Um, so thankfully, with all my students, I had field assistants on hand and I started collecting fish in Lake Berman as a Peace Corps volunteer. And sampling in Berman was incredible. I had a teeny tiny little net and you'd pull the net through the water and you'd come up with a handful of fish like this. And while it may not seem like much here, let me tell you, there are five species of fish in my hand. And every single species of fish here is only found in this one lake, Lake Berman, and nowhere else in the entire world. In fact, that teeny tiny lake has 11 species of fish in it, which makes it one of the most biodiverse habitats per unit area in the world. So I was really excited about studying these fish in Lake Berman as a Peace Corps volunteer. And I, as I was finishing up my, my service there, I said, I need to find a way to continue studying African fish because this is just the coolest thing ever. So in 2013, I finished the Peace Corps and started graduate school. I signed up for a PhD program at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and was studying fish diversity and fish morphology in Central Africa. And you can see me here in the fish lab with a couple jars of a couple hundred fish. And these are the specimen that I study. But I was not satisfied with my field work. I wanted to go back out and sample more areas. I had only sampled one lake in Cameroon. I hadn't even fished the rivers around it. And there was so much more to explore and discover. So in 2015, I returned to Cameroon for my round two, this time as a National Geographic Explorer. And I knew so much more about Cameroon and the fishes of Cameroon because I'd been studying fish at a PhD level for a couple of years now. And I knew that Cameroon had just about as many fish species as the entire continent of Europe, which means that Cameroon is incredibly biodiverse for fish species. And I also learned that Cameroon is highly volcanic. And I took this photograph on top of Mount Cameroon, and these are two very recently formed volcanic craters. And much of Cameroon is volcanic, and these craters are scattered throughout the country. And it's pretty easy to imagine how after a few thousand years of tropical rain, volcanic craters like this could fill with water and become volcanic crater lakes. And in fact, Cameroon has 34 volcanic crater lakes scattered throughout the country, including Lake Berman, where I had done my sampling as a Peace Corps volunteer. So I started thinking to myself, Berman had 11 species of fish in it. What types of fish are in all these other lakes in the country? I want to go and find that out. So I set out in Cameroon with the following goals. I wanted to travel to as many lakes as I could and sample the fishes. And then I wanted to use this information on biodiversity and, and endemism. So if the species are found only in that lake or not, um, to kind of prioritize the lakes for conservation. And so I spent six months traveling through Cameroon um, and was able to sample uh, nine of the 10 volcanic crater lakes. They're shown here. All of them were in the Southwest region. And that's in part because of limited time, but also because of uh, just kind of danger in some of the other regions. Uh, so I focused in the Southwest region and I was able to sample nine of the 10 lakes in the, in the region, uh, in 33 rivers. I collected over 3,500 fish specimen and approximately 80 fish species. Now that is a lot of fish species. That's about half as many fish species as are in the entire state of California. Um, and I did this all alone in six months in a small part of Cameroon. Um, 
Now, before I move on to the next slide, let me just say, don't, don't panic. There is some data, but there's only one slide of data, and I'm going to walk you through it. Um, and I even put it on a cute, watery background to make it less intimidating. So this graph shows fish biodiversity, number of fish species per lake that I sampled in the Southwest region. And these, this bar graph is color coded uh, with blue species being endemic species. Those are fish that are found only in one lake and nowhere else in the entire world. The green species are considered cosmopolitan species. So these are species that are naturally found in the lake, but also found in the surrounding river systems. And then the red coloration is introduced species. These are species that are not natural in the lakes and have been introduced more recently by humans. Now, there are some takeaways from this figure that I'm gonna just walk you through slowly. First, several of the lakes have no fish in them. And this is because volcanic crater lakes are inherently isolated. There may have just never been fish that have ever got, have never arrived in these lakes. Another takeaway is that several of these lakes have a lot of fish species. Three of these teeny tiny volcanic lakes have over 10 fish species. And as I mentioned for Lake Berman, that makes them some of the most rich in biodiversity uh, of any habitat globally. Another takeaway from this is that there are introduced species in two of the lakes already. And introduced species, uh, invasive species in particular, have devastating impacts on na native biodiversity and have been linked, at least in the female lake at Meninguba, to species extinctions in Cameroon. So this work that I did really in informs conservation efforts in the region focused on these lakes. Now, I'm gonna just spend the remainder of the talk talking about a couple of these lakes so that you can actually see what it's like to study fish biodiversity in Central Africa. And I'm gonna start by talking about Lake Burumbium Bow, the most species rich lake in the country. Um, and Lake Burumbiambo is the largest lake in, in the Southwest region, and it's also the deepest lake. It, it's about 1,500 feet deep and is home to 16 fish species, 13 of which are only found in that one lake and nowhere else in the entire world. And to give you an idea of what this biodiversity looks like, every single fish species on this slide was collected in this lake. It is an incredibly biodiverse area. There are very few lakes as unique as this lake. And moreover, most of these fish are not found anywhere else in the world. So if we are going to protect these species, we need to protect this ecosystem. The other thing that's really interesting about Lake Burumbi and Bow is the Burumbi people themselves. So the Burumbi people live on the lakeside and they are historic fishermen. This is my, my collaborator and coworker, Alphonse Tongan. He is a fisherman and he supports his family of four on a salary derived from fishing. And he, like 15 other fishermen in, in the village, goes and fishes with gill nets every single day. And this is his catch. And this is on a typical day, and you can see there's about 100 fish in his boat. He fishes 365 days a year and catches about 160 or 100 fish each day. When I did the math and calculated how many fish these 15 fishermen are collecting every year, it's over a half a million fish are being caught from this lake every single year and sold to local populations. Now, that is an unsustainable fishery, and these species are at risk of overfishing and collapse. And that's why several of the fish species in Lake Burumbi and Bo are listed as endangered or critically endangered. Unfortunately, as of 2015, nothing had been done to protect all of this biodiversity. And as a function of the work that I did, uh, the Rainforest Trust has now started a conservation program in Lake Burumbiambo, working with the fishermen that I was working with 
to actually start a conservation and management program to protect these species. So Lake Barumbian Bow was not only the most biodiverse lake that I sampled, but it also was the lake where I saw the impact of my work, where I saw conservation happen as a function of the work that I've done. And so that makes Barumbian Bow one of my favorite lakes in Cameroon. But let me tell you a little bit about one of my least favorite lakes, because it wasn't always great. It often looked like this when I was in Cameroon. I was often, you know, up to my neck in thorns and brush and hacking my way through the forest with a machete all alone, just trying to get to these lakes. So let me tell you about Lake Edib, which was my least favorite lake in all of Cameroon. And I was really excited for Edib. Before traveling to Cameroon to sample all of these lakes, I thought that Lake Edib might be the next Lake Berman. I thought that we might find dozens of new species of fish in this lake. It had never been sampled by a scientist ever in, in its history, and, and it's located remote in a national park, and uh, it was at the right elevation to, be, to have fishes in it. So I was really excited about it. But Lake Edib is remote. It's in the middle of a national park, in the middle of a poorly developed region of Cameroon. And so getting to Lake Edib was a challenge. I took a long motorcycle ride and then a bus ride. And then I got on a, on a truck. The truck drove for about 10 minutes and then it got buried in the mud and we had to dig the truck out. And then 10 minutes later, our engine broke down and we basically walked the rest of the way. By the time we got to the end of the road, it was, the, it was late in the day and I knew I was gonna have to sleep in this village before hiking out toward Edib the next morning. And so I spent the night in Mwambong that evening. And I sat down with the chief of Mwambong and I kind of told him, oh chief, you know, I'm gonna go out to Lake Edib, I'm gonna sample the fish, and uh, I'm gonna spend a week out in the forest. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, Mr. Joe, are you sure? Lake Edib is far and nobody lives out there. And, and that lake is creepy. The water is black and we think it's haunted. So I would, you know, I'm not gonna stop you, but I would not join you out in the field. And I said, you know, oh chief, I've sampled four or five lakes already. I can deal with another lake. Being out in the forest isn't gonna be too hard for me. He said, okay, well, you gotta sleep here tonight. I'll find a guide for you and uh, you can head out tomorrow. And so the chief gave me a place to sleep and gave me one last meal before I head into the forest. And this was my meal. And this is the traditional dish of the Pagosi people. It's a dish called mpoop, uh, and it's being served here with plantains. And I said mpoop, that is M-P-O-O-P, which is not the most appetizing sounding dish, but it is actually quite delicious. And that evening I ate a couple plates of mpoop with the chief. But had I known that on day four, of our trip out into the forest, our food would run out and we'd be starving the rest of the trip. I would have eaten three or four plates of this and poop that evening. Uh, not my favorite dish in the world, but certainly uh, a good dish before you head into the forest. So the next morning I wake up and the chief introduces me to my guide, a young man who called himself Starboy. And so Starboy and I headed out into the forest. And you can imagine when you're sampling fish, you've got a lot of gear. You've got nets, you've got your trap, you've got a huge backpack, you've got a jug of ethanol preserving for preserving fish, you've got all these bags for carrying fish, you just got all this gear. And so I'm loaded down with everything I can possibly carry, struggling against the weight of it. And Starboy says, oh yeah, I'll carry that little wicker trap of yours, you know, the thing that weighs like a pound and I'm sitting there struggling behind Starboy, sweating, carrying as much as I can. Um, and we start hiking out, it's beautiful. And about 10 minutes into the hike, it starts to rain. And about 20 minutes into the hike, we are literally walking through a flooded forest. It just became absurd how wet it was. And we walked all day, we're soaked, all of our stuff. And we finally get to Edib Village. And Edib Village has been abandoned for 15 years. Uh, just because it was so remote and 
it would never develop. It would never develop because it was inside of a national park. So the people left it. And this was our new home for the next week. And it doesn't look too shabby here from the outside. But once you go inside, you can see that it was pretty rustic. Um, we had a small place for a fire and we could dry our wet clothing above the fire. And here on the right, you can kind of see our kitchen slash lab for processing fish. So you'd have, you know, your fish right there next to your dinner. And uh, Starboy and I just slept on the dirt floor here uh, because the two rooms on the side were so full of rats that we didn't even dare go inside of them. Uh, so this was our home for the next week, but we still hadn't made it to the lake. The lake's another half day walk from Edib Village. So the next day we set out again. Again, Starboy's just carrying the trap and I'm carrying all the gear. We get to the volcanic crater and this is actually the view from the crater you still can hardly see the lake here starboy and i are hacking our way down the crater and we get down to the base but there's no water uh there's just this big swamp it's a big marshland and we're walking through these grasses that are head height and there's a little bit of dampness around our feet so actually i think it's a little like a walking on a sponge so when you step water pools around your feet and we could kind of see oh i think that there's open water i think that there's a lake a little further down so we we kind of push our way through this grassy marsh and as we're walking the wet sponge beneath our feet becomes more and more wet and pretty soon it goes over your feet and then it goes over your boots and then you're walking knee deep in the water but you're still in this grass that's head height um, and pretty soon you're waist deep in the water and you're kind of swimming through this grassland. And the only way you could get dry was by pushing down a big pile of, of grass, matting it down and climbing on top of it so that you could get up out of the water at all. We did this for about 20 minutes until we finally got to the water's edge and the clouds opened up and it was gorgeous. And I matted down a pile of, of the grasses to stand on and I'm just sitting there smiling and take a selfie. Me and Starboy are cracking a couple jokes, feeling great. And then I set down my camera and I look and I've got a leech on me, on my arm. And I say, oh, Starboy, check yourself. There are leeches. Starboy lifts up his pant legs and he says, oh no, Mr. Joe, there are lots of them. And I lift up my pant legs and I probably had at least a dozen leeches on me. And they were fully engorged. They'd been sucking my blood probably since the start of the swamp. So me and Starboy are ripping these leeches off, screaming and shouting. And we get them all off and we finally realize, oh man, we haven't even started fishing yet. We have a week of sampling here. And I spent a full week there putting my net in the water, putting my trap in the water, throwing my net, wading to and from the, the, the abandoned village of Edib. I got so desperate that I even sifted through the sediments on the bottom looking for larval fishes and fish eggs. But in my whole week there, I didn't catch a single fish. It turns out that Lake Edib was fishless. So I went through all this suffering. I practically starved in the forest. I had leeches on me. I slept in an abandoned hut for a week. I endured the terrible roads and there were no fish at the end of it all. It was a very long week, and that was one of my least favorite weeks in Cameroon. Um, so when I finished up my work in Cameroon, I, I came home and I just started telling everyone about it because I was so passionate about this stuff that I wanted to share the story, inspire other people to think about it, and hopefully get some conservation done in that area. And that's kind of how I've in integrated with National Geographic and why I'm speaking to you all today. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank you all so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed looking at some of the beautiful fish. I mean, this one is an ex exceptionally beautiful fish. I hope you appreciate that. And uh, I wanna just open it up to some questions here. Um, so let me take off my share screen. And... You guys should see me here in a second. All right, Joe, you're back. Yeah, and, and Joe, before I hand it back to you, can I just add one last thing? Uh, 
you know, I think kind of the point of this whole talk was, you know, if you find an opportunity, take it and, and just try to make the most of it, run with it. And also don't be afraid to pursue your passions, no matter how odd it is. When I tell people that I love fish and I study fish for a living, most people think, oh, you're a little bit weird, Joe, but I don't care. I love fish and it's great and it's taken me all over the world and I feel like I've got the coolest job and the best opportunities and it's because I pursued this weird passion and have just followed it my whole life. So if, you, if you're passionate about something, don't shy away from it. Find the opportunities to continue doing what you're passionate about and you'll find yourself doing very cool stuff too. So thank you so much again. And I'd love to hear if you've got questions. All right. Well, again, Joe, thanks so much. That was great. Um, great storytelling. And I love that point to chase your passions. And, you know, I think it's really important for students to know that, like you said, there is st still so much out there to explore and discover. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. There is All right. so much. Thank you. Well, let's meet some classrooms. Before we go to our live classrooms, I can see there's groups who are watching us on YouTube. So if you use the YouTube chat sidebar, if you just minimize your screen, um, you'll be able to send us in some questions. So let us know who you are and where you're watching from, and we'll squeeze some of those in. But for now, let's meet some classrooms. So let's go to just down the road from me, about 20 minutes down the road to Guelph, Ontario. Um, Mrs. Furnival is joining us uh, with a grade two classroom. How are we doing grade twos? Well, actually, Joe, I'm sorry, our, and both Joes, our grade twos had to leave just because they, they had about 10 minutes to have their lunch before recess. But we do have some other students here, and we have a visitor from a high school as well who's never seen um, these um, Google Hangouts before. Great. All so, right. What, so we, do, we were wondering, though, if we are aspiring scientists, what would you suggest for us as um, for us to do in terms of moving forward in the future. If we wanted to become a National Geographic explorer as well. You know, I would say continue, you know, find what you're passionate about and then dive into it. You don't need to wait until you're in college to dive into research. I actually have been working with a high school student studying cichlid diversity in Central Africa. And this is someone who just is passionate about fish, I, he found me on Facebook and said, hi, Joe, it looks like you're doing something fun. Can I help you? And I said, yes. And so what I would say to do is, you know, think about what you're passionate about. Think about what you might like to do. Find someone who inspires you and reach out to them. You know, people love to inspire the next generation. So if you want to reach out to someone, I think generally speaking, they'd be happy to, to mentor you. So reach out to people, engage with them. And then once you head off to, to college, be sure that you start doing research as early as possible because there's a steep learning curve in the, research, in the academic world. And the earlier you start doing research, the better off you'll be. I did four years of research when I was an undergraduate and it was incredibly valuable to get me started upon my career as a, as a scientist. All right, some great advice. Um, let's see, let's jump to another classroom. We'll visit um, Mrs. Kalachi's group. They're grade sixes joining us in Peterborough, Ontario. Let me turn their microphone on. Oh, where is that? There it is. How's it going, grade sixes? Hi. Hi. You've got to come nice and close for us. Your microphone's a little quiet. I love that question. And it's one of the hardest questions possible because when you love fish like I do, I could go on and on and on and on about these fish. So the, the fish I usually go to when I'm gonna say my favorite fish is the electric catfish. I didn't know, I don't know if you know that there are electric catfish out there, but there are these really silly looking electric catfish. They are almost like hot pink with a couple black stripes on the tail. And they are they look like swimming sausages. They have really tiny fins and they're really fat and they're really round. 
and uh, they just like they look really dopey, and uh, they produce electricity, and they are strongly electric. And so a big electric catfish can put out 350 volts or so, which is more than comes out of a wall outlet. And so sometimes you'll be fishing and you'll be, you know, poking around with a net and you will get electrocuted in the water and it'll be a catfish chasing you out of the water. And so to me, that is probably the coolest fish that I run into in Africa. And actually, I, I had a pet electric catfish for a while here in California. And I'd bring all my friends over to have them stick their hand in the aquarium to get electrocuted. So that's one of my favorite fish in the whole world. Pretty cool. Pretty wild electric catfish. Classrooms, uh, it's definitely something, a little homework for afterwards to look it up and take a look at that fish. It sounds pretty cool. All right, let's see. Let's go to, there we go, Mrs. Tugby's class, grade sevens in Mississauga, Ontario. Um, let me turn their microphone on. Hi. Are we doing great? Hi. Hi. Um, what is the geographical place that you have visited that's had the most uh, diversity in fit? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I may, have, I think I heard it all, but I may have lost it. You asked, what was the the location that I visited with the most biodiversity of fishes. Um, and actually, yes. it's not in Cameroon, surprisingly. So I talked all about Cameroon today, but the most biodiverse spot that I sampled in Cameroon was Lake Burumbian Bow. I do work also in Gabon, and I sampled the Evindo River near Makuku in the northern part of Gabon. And in about a week, in one river, we caught over 90 species of fish. And we only collected about half of the known di diversity in the area. There's about 180 species of fish in that area. So to me, 90 species in a week is pretty darn incredible. Um, and we only got to half the biodiversity in the region. So that to me is the most biodiverse area I've ever fished. And it was just an unbelievable place to sample fishes. It was so much fun. Great question, great sevens. Let's jump over to, here we go. Let's go to Thunder Bay, Ontario this time. So we've got a grade four classroom uh, with Mr. Levine. Let me turn their microphone on. Good. How are we doing grade fours? Good. Awesome. Oh What's the biggest fish fish you've ever caught? Oh, I used to ask everybody that. Every adult I ever met, I'd always ask them, what's the biggest fish you ever caught? Um, to be honest, most of the fish I catch are tiny. Uh, almost every fish I catch in Africa is teeny, 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 tiny. The biggest fish I've ever caught was probably about a 60-pound bat ray. And... I caught it in the San Francisco Bay fishing with my mother. And my mother was screaming and shouting, get that bat ray away from me. And I was saying, mom, you gotta take a picture. I gotta take a picture with this giant bat ray. And so I'm holding this bat ray, you know, crushed under it. But yeah, probably about a 60 pound bat ray. So not even a huge fish. I wouldn't be surprised if Joe's caught bigger fish than I have. All right, well, I, I am more of a fish observer, more of a scuba diver. So I've seen bigger fish, but I haven't caught a bigger one. So you got me beat, Joe. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see, who have we visited yet? Uh, Mrs. Perino's class, grade six is joining us in Burlington, Ontario. Let me turn their microphone on. Hi. How are we doing grade sixes? Hello, okay. Our class, again, with us. We're, we're only two people now. We're not class, but we've got uh, Do you guys have to go for a recess? Uh, no. Go ahead. Uh, what was the most uh, dangerous fish you encountered? You know, most fish aren't dangerous. That's one of the, the pities I find when you watch shows like River Monsters and Monster Fish. There's a lot of characterizing fish as monsters. 
And I find that most fish are not at all dangerous. Even the fish with big teeth or big spines or, you know, all those things, they're, they don't want to hurt you at all. Um, you know, I've, I've been stabbed by fish. I've been poisoned by fish. There's a lot of venomous catfish out there. Um, I've been bitten by countless fish. But never have I ever felt like there was anything dangerous. Um, the worst thing I would say I've ever experienced with fish was getting stung by a Cynodontus catfish. And I, I say stung. They have spines on their pectoral fins and their dorsal fin. And I put my knee down in a canoe and I had a dorsal fin go into my shin bone. And they have really serious spines that are very serrated. So they've got hooks on them and they're venomous. So I had a big swollen leg and a sore leg for the rest of the day, but I wasn't at risk of death or anything like that. Um, it was just painful. It'd be like being stung by a wasp and then also having to pull a fish hook out of your leg. So it's a little uncomfortable, but not not dangerous. And I I've never ever in my life felt at risk being around fishes. All right, all in the name of science, a little sting or scrape here and there. What's the big deal? Uh-huh. All right, our final live class from Mr. Steltman's class. They're also in Burlington, Ontario, a grade five class. Let me turn their microphone on. Actually, Mr. S oh, it worked. Mr. Steltman's class, how's it going? Good, um, how are you? Great. Not bad. Go for it, David. Um, how many species of fish have you ever like encountered? You know, I was trying to do that mental math, and it's so hard because it depends on how you count it, right? If I if I counted every fish species I've ever seen, I've seen a lot of fish in museums and a lot of fish in aquarium. If you've asked, if you're asking how many fish have I put into a museum, how many different fish species? That's a much easier question, and I would say that I'm a I'm probably about at 330 fish species at this point. Um, so that's quite a few, 330 fish species, but it's about a hundredth of the fish biodiversity globally. So there are 33,000 fish species and I've only seen about 330 of them. So I, I'm, I'm working on it. Thank you very much. I'm, I'd like to, to see a few more, um, and I think that I will. The, the, I've, I've focused so much in Gabon and Cameroon that often I'll go to a place and catch the same fish twice or the same species twice. But if you went to the Amazon or you went to the Mekong or you went to even the East Coast or Ontario, uh, you could catch new, new fish species. So uh, anywhere you go, as long as you're looking for diversity, you always find something new. And that's one of the great things about being an explorer is once you think like an explorer, you can explore anywhere. All right, great question. Um, so boys and girls, I know that some classrooms may have to start ducking out for the recesses, but um, feel free to do that, but we'll keep things open. And if you wanna wave at the camera, uh, let me know if there's another question, I'll choose your classroom. So let's see. There we go. Looks like we have Mr. Levine's class in Thunder Bay. Your microphone's on again. Yeah. What's the most dangerous fish? Most dangerous fish globally. You know, the... I don't even, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. There are, there are fish that are dangerous. You know, a stonefish is poisonous um, or venomous. A great white shark is a fish and people often think of them as dangerous. Uh, I don't generally think of most fish as dangerous. People think of piranhas as dangerous, but piranhas, they won't kill you. It's pretty unlikely. Um, you know, I think, that bull sharks are pretty aggressive and dangerous uh but i've never encountered a fish that i was afraid of i'm afraid of a lot of things but not really fishes um 
And I would say that, you know, a lot of people fear fish. They look weird. They, you know, don't blink. But I think that generally speaking, there's there's nothing to fear about fishes. Uh, as long as you don't bother them, they won't bother you. I've seen great white sharks in person, and I never felt afraid of it. So I, I could hardly imagine seeing any fish and saying, man, that's a scary fish. All right. That's an excellent point. Um, another question from a classroom. If you want to wave, if you have another one, and I'll pick your class. All right. Mrs. Kolochi's class. Your microphone's on. Do you have a question? Yeah, I catch plenty of small fish. Um, now, I'm going to distinguish in two ways. I've caught plenty of juvenile fish. I've caught fish that are one day old. And so those fish are about a half a centimeter long. But I've also caught species of fish that are tiny. The second smallest fish in the world is in Gabon. It's a fish called Grassichthys gabonensis and it's less than an inch long as an adult and they're completely transparent you can see through the fish and they retain almost all their juvenile characteristics until they're adults so it's basically a larval fish that breeds and it's grassichthys gabonensis second smallest fish in the world that's probably the smallest i've ever seen Excellent. And then any other classrooms? Do you guys have any more follow-up questions? Oh, Mr. Saltman's class, your microphone's on. How many rivers have you explored? That's a great question. I do a lot more river work in Gabon than I do in Cameroon. So, whew, last year I spent six months in Gabon and we sampled about 140 different sites. And that would probably represent 50 rivers or so. So I would say we're probably up to about 100 different rivers in Central Africa uh, that I've sampled at this point. Uh, but, you know, the hard, the, the reason that that question is a little bit hard is because rivers flow into one another. So if I sample up here and I sample here and I sample here, are those all the same river or are those three different rivers? So if you count it as three rivers, it'd be a lot more than that. If you count it as one river, it might be fewer than that. All right, and we'll check in one more time with Mrs. Tugby's group and see if they have a final question. Go ahead, it's okay. Go. Do you guys have any, do you know any endangered species? species of fish in North America currently? Oh yes, there are several endangered species of fish in North America. Um, locally here in, in California, one that gets a lot of attention is the Delta smelt. Now this is a teeny tiny fish that only lives in the San Francisco Bay Delta, but managing that species is very costly for California. So it gets a lot of publicity. Um, you can also think of a lot of the salmonids. So Pacific salmon, several of the, the runs of salmon are endangered. Uh, steelhead as well. So there are a lot of native fish that are endangered in North America. In fact, there are probably more endangered species of fish in North America than there are in Gabon. But that's also because Gabon is so much less studied than North America that there are fewer scientists actually to make the designation as endangered. All right. Well, classrooms, first of all, thank you so much for the great questions. It was great to hang out with you this morning. And you've always got, obviously, really good questions. And Joe, thank you so much for sharing uh, a little bit with us about your passion for studying fish, about some of your adventures. And, you know, I, I enjoyed that story of, um, of the big search out of the lake and finding nothing because, you know, failure happens, but those are learning experiences. And I'm sure... If you can go back in time, I don't know, maybe that's a good question. Would you go back to that lake? Would you relive it? <laughs> I would 100% go back to that lake. I would have just stopped to take a photograph before I ripped all the leeches off. That's yeah. the one thing I'd do again, because the leeches weren't even that bad.
All right, excellent. Well, Joe, thanks so much. It's uh, always a pleasure to host Exciting Explorers and you're definitely doing some amazing work. And maybe one final question, have you been able to name any of those new species? We're in the process of naming a new uh, Enteromia species and we're naming it, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, so don't publish it. Uh, I mean, it can be online. Uh, Enteromius meoconensis uh, after the waterfall that we basically collected it in. And it's an interesting species because it's found only at one site right next to where a hydroelectric dam is proposed. And so we're hoping that we can draw attention to this new species that if the dam is built, the species will probably be driven extinct. So we're hoping to, you know, kind of direct conservation in that area by describing this new species and naming it after the site. All right, excellent. Well, that's another really important point is going out and finding that biodiversity is is great for conservation and, and for trying to kind of steer projects like this in a better, more controlled way or maybe stopping them entirely. Yeah, the goal of it all is to inform conservation so that we can actually save these fish forever. All right. Well, again, Joe, lots of fun hanging out today. I know the classrooms enjoyed it. Lots of great questions. And uh, what we'll do is we will turn all the microphones on and we'll give the classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you. Great. So here we go, boys and girls, nice and loud. All right, well again, classrooms, thanks for hanging out with us. Joe, you enjoy the rest of your day, and Thank you, uh, we'll definitely see you again for another hangout. Sounds good. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for setting it up.